months after the death of three infants. This follows November's crib recall, which was the largest in U.S. history. Recently, this House hearing looked into new safety standards for cribs. Witnesses include the chairman of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the agency that issued today's recall. This is two hours and 15 minutes. Good morning and welcome. We're going to begin this hearing, the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Our hearing today is entitled, Assessing the Need for Better Oversight on Crib Safety. Members will be recognized for opening statements. I will begin. Today we are here to answer a painful and difficult question. Are we doing enough to protect infants and toddlers from injury and death in their cribs? Most experts agree that the safest place for an infant to sleep is in a properly made crib that meets the highest safety standards. Babies sleeping on their backs in a crib with a fur mattress and without soft bedding are less likely to die from SIDS or accidentally suffocate. Our work today is critical because of the unique nature of a baby crib. As we will hear from our witnesses, a baby crib is the only product designed expressly so parents can leave their child unattended for a long period of time and, and be confident that their child will be safe. It is reasonable for parents to expect that the crib they purchase meets safety standards enforced by a strong regulator. Unfortunately, this subcommittee has learned that those reasonable expectations of crib safety have not been met. The Consumer Product Safety Commission, CPSC, the government agency tasked with keeping consumer products safe for Americans, has recalled millions of cribs in recent years after investigating reports of broken and defective crib hardware, drop sides that detach, and poor wood quality. What is most shocking is that all of these recalled cribs were certified as meeting the industry's voluntary safety standards. The crib recalls raise questions about the effectiveness of the current regulations and lead some parents to doubt whether any crib on the market is safe. In November of 2009, the CPSC announced the recall of more than 2 million stork craft drop side cribs, the largest crib recall in U.S. history. And just this Tuesday, the CPSC announced yet another voluntary recall involving 635,000 drop side and fixed rail cribs manufactured by Durrell Asia Corporation. Congress instructed the CPSC to revisit its safety standards for cribs under the Consumer, Protect Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008. CPSC is prepared to meet that obligation. Our hearing will detail the crib, rec recent crib recalls and consider how CPSC plans to prevent cribs with significant defects from entering the market. We will also examine industry's role in ensuring that their products are safe and if crib standards are designed to keep consumers safe. Today we will hear specifically about the safety concerns of drop side cribs. A drop side crib allows a parent to raise and lower the front of the crib for easy access to their baby as opposed to fixed rail crib which has four sides that do not move up or down. According to the Juvenile Products Manufacturer Association, retailers sold approximately 500,000 full-size cribs in 2008, of which 15 to 20 percent had drop sides. Since 2005, the CPSC has announced more than 30 recalls of 7 million cribs for a variety of safety problems, many of them involving drop sides. CPSC experts have found that mattress support brackets and drop side hardware can break, deform, or are lost. Design flaws permit consumers to intentionally or unintentionally install the drop side railing upside down, putting unintended stress on the crib hardware. Many different problems can cause the drop side to detach, creating a dangerous gap between the crib railing and the crib mattress. As this simulated picture from the CPSC shows, it should be up here on our screen, in some cases, the body of an infant or toddler can become trapped in the space and a child can suffocate. Since 2007, the CPSC has issued recalls involving millions of drop side cribs sold by different manufacturers. The CPSC has issued four recalls of drop side cribs manufactured by Simplicity after receiving reports of dozens of incidents involving several deaths. In October 2008, the CPSC recalled nearly one million Delta brand drop side cribs. The CPSC issued two recalls in 2009 of Stork Craft drop side cribs for problems associated with the brackets that hold the mattress in place and problems with the crib's plastic hardware. The CPSC linked four deaths associated with Stork Craft faulty cribs. In November 2009 recall, 
involved more than 2 million cribs, the largest crib recall in U.S. history. The fact that most recalls have involved cribs that were built in compliance with current voluntary safety standards shows that our system for measuring and ensuring and enforcing crib safety is not working. The Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association, a national trade association representing more than 250 companies, certified that Simplicity, Delta, and Storecraft cribs involved in each of these recalls met all U.S. standards and voluntary industry standards. The JPMA gave these cribs their seal of approval. Unfortunately, neither the mandatory nor the voluntary standards were or are strict enough. JPMA will be testifying at today's hearing, and I look forward to learning more about what the crib industry must do to improve its safety record. In November 2008, the CPSC acknowledged that the mandatory and voluntary standards do not include adequate performance requirements for durability of drop side crib hardware, the strength and quality of the wood used to make the cribs, and the utility and clarity of crib assembly instructions. I look forward to the CPSC chairperson's testimony today about what the Commission can do to develop and enforce stronger crib safety standards. Today we will also examine the November recall of 2 million store craft drop side cribs as a case study on the need for better regulation and oversight of crib safety. First, what can Congress, the CPSC and crib manufacturers learn from these massive recalls? And second, how does the CPSC plan to address the ongoing safety problems with drop side cribs under its rulemaking authority? The CPSC has a legal authority to tackle this problem and restore American consumers' confidence in the safety of cribs. Because of the work of some of the members of this subcommittee, particularly Congresswoman Schakowsky, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act requires the CPSC to study and develop safety standards for durable nursery products, including full-size cribs. The Act directs the PCSC either to accept the existing voluntary safety standards for these products and make them mandatory, or provide a stricter federal safety standard. Our hearing today consists of three panels of witnesses. First, we'll hear from Mrs. Susan Chirigliano, who lost her son Bobby in 2004 when the drop side of Bobby's crib detached and he suffocated. Mrs. Chirigliano and her husband have been working to ban drop side cribs in New York State. Second, we'll hear from Michael Dwyer of the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association and Nancy Coles of Kids in Danger a consumer organization founded in 1998 by the parents of a toddler who died when a portable crib collapsed around his neck. These this witnesses will be able to share their perspectives on crib safety, consumer protection, and comment on CPSC's rulemaking authority. And finally, we'll hear from the chairperson of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Inez Moore Tannenbaum. I want to thank all of our witnesses for participating in today's hearing. In particular, I want to thank the Shriglianos for their time, their testimony, traveling from New York to share their personal tragedy with us and the American people. In preparation for this hearing, the subcommittee requested and received documents from the Consumer Product Safety Commission and the Juvenile Product Manufacturer Association. The CPSC and JPMA have been very cooperative with the subcommittee document request and produced tens of thousands of pages of documents over the holidays. I appreciate their cooperation with this important inquiry. In addition, the subcommittee requested documents from Storkraft, a Canadian-based crib manufacturer whose dropside cribs were subject of the largest recall in CPSC history. Storkraft has pledged its cooperation and just yesterday provided the subcommittee with its first submission of some responsive emails. I urge Storkraft to cooperate fully and complete its production of documents promptly. Storkraft will not be testifying here today, but we look forward to reviewing their submissions, the documents they submitted yesterday, and reserved the right to schedule an additional hearing if necessary to bring Storkraft here and to explain their role in the recall process and its responsibility to ensure the safe manufacture of cribs. With that, I'll yield back to balance my time. I'd next like to turn to the ranking member of this subcommittee, Mr. Walden of Oregon, and they've been very cooperative and we've worked well on this one and I think we have, may have future hearings, but Greg, thanks for your efforts in this here issue. Uh, thank you, Barton. I appreciate uh, your holding this hearing and uh, the work that uh, both sides have done on this issue. I, I first want to mention that I'm uh, also scheduled to be in a telecommunications subcommittee right. markup right. session that's going on right now. We're actually voting on, on a couple of bills, so I may have to step out and go down to that committee and, and then I will return. I, I want to extend a warm welcome to the Seriglianos. Um, we're, we really feel awful about the loss that you've suffered. Um, it's unthinkable 
um, and uh, it's it's the last thing any parent wants to, to go through and so you uh, you have our deepest condolences and, and sympathy thank you for traveling here thank you for telling us your story um, we look forward to your testimony I admire your courage and, and your willingness to speak up and uh, make a difference in, in public policy. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission is charged, as you've heard from my colleague, with protecting the public from an unreasonable risk of serious injury or death from thousands of products. Infant cribs are one of the products under CPS, uh, CPSC's jurisdiction and a major focus of that agency. The Commission has acted in the past several months to recall millions of dropside cribs. Today we have an opportunity to examine the recall process and product integrity questions raised by the latest Storkcraft brand crib recall and understand the roles of the company, the agency and the consumer play in ensuring the effectiveness of the recall and keeping children safe. Our goals here today are first, to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the current system and second, to discuss possible solutions to improve safety and oversight while still allowing access to a wide range of products with the assurance of the public's safety. We'll also consider the ASTM international standards specifically for crib manufacturers that were released in December of last year. ASTM is an entity that develops technical product standards that guide the CPSC's evaluation of products. We'll want an assessment from our witnesses of whether the new ASTM standards will eliminate or significantly reduce the risk of serious injury. I welcome CPSC Chairman uh, Tenenbaum and look forward to her statement and the opportunity to ask questions. I am anxious to hear if and when the Commission will adopt the ASTM standard and if not, why not. I am also interested in learning about the complex matrix the agency uses to determine when a certain number of isolated consumer complaints and incidents evolve into a full-blown investigation and lead to an ultimate product recall. Congress has not been inactive when it comes to increasing federal regulation of juvenile products and increasing the effectiveness of product recalls. The Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008 addresses several of these issues that bring us here today. Ms. Tenenbaum will be able to talk about the new authorities of the Commission that they have as, uh, under CPS, uh, C, CPSIA, including new rulemaking procedures that allow the agency to revise its mandatory product standards more easily, new product registration programs, and increases in the agency's budget. With the implementation in the last administration of the early warning system, the CPSC staff and previous Commission leadership were already increasing their surveillance of cribs, bassinets, and play yards. This system helped trigger the recalls of millions of cribs since that time. I hope the Chairwoman will talk about this system and how it can be expanded, strengthened, improved under uh, the new leadership of the Commission. Since medical experts agree the safest place for an infant to sleep is in a crib, I want to know what we can do to increase consumer confidence in these products to ensure that parents are not discouraged from purchasing a crib at all. The consumer, the companies that manufacture these products, CPSC and Congress must work together to improve communications and quickly yet thoroughly respond to products that may pose a threat. I do hope that as we move forward, the CPSC will be able to maintain a strong level of collegiality amongst its five commissioners and that both Republicans and Democrats will work together to ensure that the CPSC effectively and wisely uses its new and additional resources and authorities to improve crib and product safety. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the witnesses. And again, at some point, I'll have to step out for this other market. Well, thank you, Mr. Walden. You make a good point. Uh, there is another hearing going down on the first floor, and members will probably be bouncing in and out. Uh, it is a markup by markup. It just means we might have a vote in committee, so we may have to leave. I will stay and keep the hearing moving on. Next, uh, Mr. Braley, for an opening statement. Three minutes, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Walden. I can't imagine a more important hearing for this committee to hold than the one we're having today. Uh, as a child growing up in the late 50s, uh, my parents had a dropside crib. As a parent whose children were born in the late 1980s, I purchased, assembled, and my kids all spent time in a drop-sided crib. And to the Sirigulianos, I want to extend to you our sympathy and also our appreciation for your courage in using this tragedy to teach others about this danger. And I can't thank you enough for coming down and spending your time to help educate us on this important issue. I'm very, very concerned about the recall, not just of these recent cribs, but of the millions of cribs that have been recalled in the last several months. 
and I believe we need to act immediately to ensure that all cribs sold in the United States meet the highest safety standards possible. You have heard the number, 635,000 cribs made in China and Vietnam by Durrell Asia recalled, this right on the heels of the largest crib recall in U.S. history two months ago. And this has been something that hits home for me personally because the most recent recall has been linked to the October 2008 death of a six-month-old infant in my state of Iowa who strangled after getting trapped in a Durrell Asia crib when the dropside hardware broke. In addition to that tragedy, the CPSC received 31 reports of incidents involving Durrell Asia dropside cribs, including six reports of children being trapped between the mattress and the dropside, and also received 36 reports of broken slats on the Durrell Asia crib. And this gets back to my point earlier. I can tell you, having purchased and assembled a dropside crib 30 years after I was in one, that the quality of materials being used in these cribs is much less than it used to be in terms of the wood products. And that is why we need to have a strong response to deal with this clear pattern of problems. In their statement, Durrell Asia said that the recalled cribs meet and exceed all applicable safety standards. If that is true, then this is just one more clear indication that we need to act as quickly as possible to strengthen and enforce any standard. These deaths are inexcusable. They involve the most vulnerable mem members of our population, and we have no excuse for not fixing this problem immediately. I am glad to hear the CPSC has taken initial steps to address the safety concerns for cribs as mandated by the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, which we passed here in 2008 and which this committee addressed in hearings. But I am concerned about the length of time this is taking. And I look forward to hearing from Chairwoman Tenenbaum about the additional steps the Commission is taking to improve and upgrade crib safety standards. Unfortunately, these crib recalls also illustrate the dangers of free and unrestricted trade with companies that don't have the same safety standards for manufacturing that we do in the United States. To ensure the safety of American families, we need to ensure that the countries we import products from are on a level playing field with those that are manufactured here in this country regarding product safety regulations. That is why, as Chairman of the Populist Caucus, I am working to make sure that future trade agreements include strong product safety standards and that products imported into the United States meet or exceed U.S. health and safety standards. And I believe that the enactment of those provisions contained in the Trade Act would go a long way toward ensuring the safety of imported products, including cribs. So I want to thank you, Chairman Stupak, for holding this timely and important hearing. I look forward to the testimony of all of our witnesses, and I hope that this hearing will be an important step forward toward the prompt implementation and strong enforcement of the highest crib safety standards possible. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Mr. Burgess, an opening statement. Three minutes, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, of course, we're here today because of a tragedy. It's a tragedy that we cannot reverse. Maybe we can prevent future tragedies. I am profoundly regretful that for so long the standards as it relates to crib safety have been voluntary and not mandatory, despite more than 7 million cribs being recalled in the last five years. One of the first speeches that uh, we have a new commissioner at the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, Inez Tenenbaum, one of her first speeches was last August, and she correctly noted that a great deal of product safety occurs by relying on consensus standards coupled with regulatory authority to re intervene quickly, and she prefaced this by saying that they should be voluntary consensus standards. This makes sense for a new commissioner who has witnessed the aftermaths of some of the mandates that were issued from the Congress through H.R. 4040, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, because we as a Congress have yet to go back and fix some of the unintended consequences that we visited upon parents and consumers with that act. However, that being said, that the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act has beleaguered the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Yes, we have improved their funding. Yes, we have improved their staffing. But I will tell you, as one of the few members of Congress who has been to the Consumer Product Safety Commission and watched the good men and women out there do their work, I will tell you that it is, uh, it is startling with the amount of work that they, uh, the amount of safety which they are asked to assure the small staff and the rather primitive working conditions that they, that they face on a daily basis. 
They don't have the manpower to implement the law, they don't have the finances, and they're vainly trying to meet the deadlines imposed. And the issue stays in enforcement, stay after stay after stay in enforcement while trying to come up with solutions. And the only real solution is Congress going back and fine-tuning some aspects of that legislation and, and fixing the mistakes that we made when, when that legislation was drafted. Section 104, the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, specifically requires the Consumer Product Safety Commission to study and develop safety standards for durable nursery products, such as infant bath seats, infant walkers, and cribs. The Consumer Product Safety Commission could have either made mandatory existing voluntary safety standards or provided a stricter federal safety standard and the Consumer Product Safety Commission were to initiate two rule makings by August two, 2009 and two more rules every six months until all durable nursery projects have a mandatory safety standard. But to date, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has only proposed safety standards for infant bath seats and infant walkers, but not cribs, the source of 30 recalls. The crib issue is an issue of failure of those trusted by the American public to act, during the last administration, the rule regarding crib safety was ad being advanced, but a new administration came in and this rule has never been finalized. Here we are a year later, we see the same problems as we've seen before. And really, Mr. Chairman, we've no one to blame but ourselves for not regulating one, not one single product, and especially cribs. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Uh, Mr. Green for uh, opening statement, please, three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, uh, oversight hearing on this important issue. There have been 30 recalls since 2005. The largest such recall happened just two months ago when more than 2 million cribs were called in November 2009. Again, on Tuesday, there were a recall of more than 600,000 cribs. These major recalls demonstrate we need to uh, to do in, what we need to do in setting safety standards for cribs and in testing enforcement of those standards. As a grandfather of four under five, I want to thank all our witnesses today, but particularly uh, the Serrano family and for the loss of their child. Uh, you know, it leaves a hole in your heart for your whole life. Um, I also want to thank our Consumer Product Safety Commission Chair uh, Tannenbaum for being here today. I look forward to hearing what actions that the Commission plans to take as it reviews safety standards for cribs as required by the Consumer Product Safety Act of 2008. ASTM International, which provides voluntary technical standards, uh, manufacturers can follow, amended their standards last month and removed standards for what had been one of the most dangerous types of cribs, a dropside crib, especially making any dropside crib non-compliant with the ASTM standards. There's a serious problem, however, that these types of cribs are not addressed sooner, either by ASTM or the CPSC, when it was the dropside crib that led to so many recalls because of the safety hazards they posed to infants and children. In 2007, a seven-month-old in my hometown of Houston died due to malfunctioning dropside crib made by Simplicity. The CPSC recalled cribs made by that manufacturer, but the overall issue of dangers uh, posed by dropside cribs was not addressed. Without knowing it, the family of the seven-year-old put the dropside crib on upside down the rail, and because of that, the hinge on the rail broke. That allowed a gap between the mattress and the rail, and the gap is where the child suffocated to death with her head against the mattress. This is not a unique problem among dropside cribs, but it's one that was not specifically addressed until December 2009 with ASTM removed standards for this type of crib. CPSC now has the authority provided by the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act to move forward with strengthening regulations relating to crib safety. And I hope it's not just uh, setting, setting standards, but enforcing testing to ensure that unsafe cribs never make it into consumer homes in the first place. I'm also concerned about the secondary market for cribs, whether it be through garage sales or resales, uh, similar to car seats. Uh, you can buy a car seat on the side of the road in Houston. It may be 20 years old, but it doesn't meet the safety standards of the day. Um, again, I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing. Look forward to testimony for all our witnesses on what Congress can do to help protect infants from these terrible accidents. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, Ms. Christensen, opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to also thank you, Chairman Stupak and Ranking Member Walden, for holding this important hearing, because becoming a parent marks the most important event in someone's life, and as parents and consumers, we trust that the products that we buy are safe 
for our children, and we need to have that reassurance. However, we're here this morning because some of those products are not safe, in particular faulty cribs that have resulted in injuries and even death. And I'd like to also add my word of welcome to the Cirigliano family, extend my sympathy to them as well, and also commend them for being here today and turning their tragedy into a crusade to save lives and preventing other parents from experiencing the same misfortune. We can all agree that we need to work diligently to make, strengthen crib standards and all standards for every um, chi uh, child um, entity and to ensure that they are meeting the highest of safety measures and providing protection to children in the manner that they are supposed to be uh, designed to do. And I'd like to also extend a thank you to all of the other witnesses for being here today and look forward to their testimonies. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shikowsky, opening statement. Uh, I know you're probably at the other hearing, but I mentioned your leading role in, in the act that we just passed in 2008 and your interest in this area. So thanks for being here and thanks again for your well, diligence thank, on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy that we're holding this hearing. This is a life or death issue, the safety of cribs. Attending hearings where we hear testimony from families of children who have died in preventable accidents is one of the hardest things I do as a member of Congress, but of course, nothing compared to what it means to the families like the Ceriglianos, who muster the incredible courage to come here and tell us their stories so that they can prevent these accidents from happening to other children. The Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act has taken a lot of heat over the last year or so, and it's true that under previous leadership, the CPSC's implementation of the law was problematic and produced widespread confusion, particularly among small business owners. But we can't lose sight of why this legislation was passed to protect children. Children like Danny Kaiser, for whom the bill was named, and Bobby Cerigliano, whose mom is, whose parents are brave enough to share their son's story today. For years, we've heard stories of the horrible injuries and deaths of children in cribs, and it's been mentioned many times how literally millions of cribs have been recalled in the last few years. No need to go through that again. But I authored the provision in the CPSIA that uh, requires the Consumer Product Safety Commission to develop strong as possible mandatory standards for durable infant and toddler products, including cribs. It's my understanding that the CPSC has proposed rules for the first two products, infant bath seats and infant walkers. I am concerned that a year and a half after the bill became law, there is still no rule for cribs. And I am eager to uh, hear from Chairman Tenbaum, who I welcome today, about how we're moving forward on such a rule. And I also want to welcome other witnesses, including Nancy Coles, a leader with whom I have worked for years on children's product safety issues. And again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. That concludes uh, all the opening statements of members. And I'd like to call our first panel of witnesses now, um, Robert and Susan Shrigliano, if you'd just please come forward. I have a chair there. Uh, as we know, Shriglianos are from uh, New York, and unfortunately and tragically, they lost their son, Bobby. It's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right under the to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do you wish to be represented by counsel? No, thank you. Okay. Witnesses uh, indicate they did not. Therefore, I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand to take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and matter pending before this committee? Yes. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have replied in the affirmative. They are under oath. I would now ask for an opening statement, uh, five-minute opening statements. Uh, your test it will be part of the record, so if you want to submit a longer statement, you may. And it's my understanding, Susan, you're going to do the test fine. Yes. Okay, would you pull that mic up a little forward, further and press the button that a, a light should go on there? Good. Good. On Just now. pull it up okay. a little bit more, please. Thank you. I'm so short. <laughs> Good morning. We are Robert and Susan Cerigliano, also known as Daddy and Mommy. But we, but we have only heard three of our four children call us that because our son Bobby never had the chance. On September 15, 2004, Bobby was six months and three days old when his head and neck were caught in the detached side rail of his crib. After the drop side rail detached, 
Bobby's head was caught between the side rail and the mattress. With his face pressed against the mattress, he suffocated. Bobby was taken from his crib, put into an ambulance, arrived at the hospital, and never came home. We miss Bobby every day, but what is most important is what Bobby misses. Bobby has an older sister who never had the chance to teach him how to get in and out of trouble. Bobby has a younger brother and sister that he has never met. Bobby has two grandfathers that he never played catch with, two grandmothers whose cookies he was never able to taste. Bobby never had a chance to wear his first Halloween costume. He didn't get to sit on Santa's lap and never blew out a birthday candle. <sighs> Sorry. Our smiles have dulled and our family will never be complete again. Other than mommy and daddy's arms, Bobby was in one of the safest places, his crib. The reality is his crib was not safe and our lives will never be the same. We refuse to allow any other family suffer the pain we have. While we are happy to hear about the millions of crib recalls, we are convinced that the only answer is a complete ban on drop side cribs. We do not believe that parents realize the severity of placing their children to sleep in a drop side crib. The one place that you would leave your child alone has become a threat. If they cannot purchase a drop side crib, they would have no option but to purchase a stationary crib. We do not believe a repair kit is the answer. If a crib has the ability to kill a child, it should not be manufactured. The recalls are downplaying the number of children that have been suffocated in a drop side crib. Our son Bobby was not included in the CPSC reports. Their reason for this is the location his drop side rail detached was not the same as the other infants. Our problem with this is the investigator's report stated the bottom left rail was not secure while Bobby's rail detached on the lower right side. The point is bottom left, bottom right, Bobby was asphyxiated and died when his drop side rail detached and he was trapped between the mattress and the side rail, just like infants before him and just like infants after him. The number of infants reported should not be determined where the rail detaches, but by the end result. We have in the last five months worked with legislation in Suffolk County having a bill passed banning the sale of drop side cribs. We have worked with Nassau County legislation banning the sale of drop side cribs and are awaiting the bill signing. We are currently working with Rockland County legislation to have the ban passed there also, which by the way, it passed on Tuesday night. We appreciate Congress inviting us to be here today to share our story. We hope you think of Bobby while you determine how to keep our babies safe. We are all they have, their lives depend on it. Thank you. Mr. Strigliano, would you like to say anything at this time? Okay, I take it. That's a no. Th thank you uh, again for being here and thank you for You're sharing welcome. your story. welcome. Thank you for inviting us. We're going to have members ask you questions and uh, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, let me ask you this. In, in your statement, you said our son Bobby was not included in the CPSC's reports. Their reason for this is the location of the drop side rail detached was not the same as other infants. Could you explain that? When we saw an interview on television regarding um, the, the manufacture of our cribs recall, the uh, chairperson at the time was asked, was asked why Bobby's um, death wasn't included in the recall. And her response was because of the location of where his drop side rail detached. Okay, there was no doubt that the rail detaching was the cause of his suffocation. It's just the location of it yeah. for, for the rules or regulations? Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Actually, um, it, it, go ahead, sir. Um, the recall crib, um, the manufacturer um, highlighted the piece that um, malfunction on my son's crib. Okay. And that was the one of the two pieces um, for the recall. And... Um, it's it's we still like an explanation for it actually <laughs> um, we we never got one um you know the manufacturer um put a picture on their website of the same exact uh piece that malfun malfunctioned on my son's crib also did you report your son's death to the cpsc consumer product safety council they came down to the medical examiner's office and they um inspected the crib Okay. <clears throat> but 
Do you have any personal knowledge? I don't mean to push you on this. I, I'm just trying to figure out, because it's my understanding there's really no requirement to report it. So we really don't know how many deaths have been caused or even the number of injuries. It, 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 was there a requirement that you know of the report to the CPSC, uh, the injury to your son? Well, I, I don't understand. I'm sorry. Were, they, were, were we required to report right. it? Right. I, I don't know. I didn't know. I mean, know. Your, your, your son went to the hospital and right. unfortunately died. Then who has the responsibility then to report it so we have accurate information of, of the information, the manual? The last thing you, you're thinking about is reporting it to us. I agree. Yeah, see, but um, after a couple of weeks, we realized that they came down and inspected the crib. Correct. Because at that point, we didn't know what had happened. Correct. Um, you know, that's, and it's really kind of a fault. So when you say they came down to inspect a crib. Yes. They would be that. local officials? Or I'm not sure. Okay. But there was a report, and um, actually there was some, some, uh, some parts of the report that didn't make sense. Um, the bottom right part, um, the bottom right um, drop side, is, was the manuf was the malfunctioning side? Right. They um, they reported the bottom left, Correct. so that was wrong also. Right. And also, they said that they asked the medical examiner if they could come and interview us, and they said the medical examiner said, um, "No, don't bother the, the family." Okay. And that turned out not to be true. Okay. So I don't know. There's just a lot of stuff in there that. Well, that's what we're trying to. Sense. Right. And if you'd like some answers, that would be nice. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, too, because when you're in a situation like that, the last thing that goes through your mind is to it, contact anybody, you know what I mean? And, and I understand your question, and, and it's a great question. Uh, from what I have on our CPS3 report, they received their information from one of the newspaper articles. Sure. But that's a wonderful question. You know, as, as a parent, when you're in that position, the last thing you're thinking about nor should the burden be on you. Right, so and I'm wondering, the maybe, maybe the local police department who, you know, correct. somebody correct. has to contact. Correct. Yeah, what we're really looking for is just a way to make sure that the Consumer Product Safety Commission and public authorities have the most complete information on, on this product or any product. I mean, just listening to the opening statements, Mr. Braley mentioned one in his uh, area. Mr. Green mentioned one. We have you. We have at least uh, four deaths reported in 2009. I'll bet you there were many more in 2009, but no one knows because how do you get the information there? Who's required to give it? In what timely manner? And then there's always the escape clause, if you will, that you have to have reason to believe whoever's doing reporting that the crib is one that was actually the cause of death, and, and it's always a way to say, well, it really wasn't a product. It was something else. Right. And in many of these cases, we, it looks like a lot of times they say, well, the parents did this wrong or the parents should have. Uh, so th th that's why, and I, I don't mean to push you. I, I, I want to expect you to know who to report it to. I'm just trying to. No, I understand. We're trying to figure out the chain of, you know, Absolutely. how it's supposed to get to where it should be. Correct. Correct. Um, that concludes my questions. Mr. Walden, for questions, please. Um, yeah, I, I think you've covered most of it, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, very well. I, I guess the question I would have is, do you think that the new system for reporting, the early warning system and all, it can be effective, is effective. I realize it wasn't in place uh, during, you know, in your, in your situation, in tragedy. But, uh, you know, it, it looks like perhaps out of your situation and that of others, they've said, okay, we got to fix how we collect these data and how we evaluate them and how we spread that out so somebody catches these problems quicker. Are, are you familiar with the new uh, early warning system? Do you think it would have made a difference in your situation? Well, yeah, there's been a lot of recalls um, from the early warning system. And, uh, you know, basically the problem was that one agency wouldn't know what right. the other agency reported. And they couldn't get their data together and put the similarities together. And I think that's, that's a big step uh, that the CPSC uh, has taken. I think it's working. I think they need, I, I think the big thing is to um, make it a mandatory, every, every single crib needs to be tested. And it shouldn't be voluntary, and we all know that. Um, you know, 
And the other big problem is these countries that are importing these cribs into the United States. And, you know, the, they're making them a lot flimsier, you could just tell. I mean, the plastic spring pegs have been a big issue, and it's a little three-quarter inch piece of plastic that's supposed to hold the whole side rail up. And, you know, back in the day, they used to make them out of metal. And, um, you know, they're just trying to, to make a cheap, they're making a cheaper product, and uh, that needs to be tested. Every single crib needs to be tested. And the uh, the new standards that are coming out or came out, I guess, the recommendations in December of, of last year, have you had a chance to review those, the no, AS, ASTM standards? No, I haven't seen them. Right. Be cu curious if you, if, and I realize you probably have other things going on in your life too than, than this, but I can certainly understand why this is such an important issue for you. But be curious to get your, your feedback at some point on the Great. ASTM standards because I, I think they address these some of these issues at least thank you mr chairman that's all i have thank you mr walden mr Braley, for questions please mr serigliano i want to follow up on that point you just made because my recollection of the crib that was in our family for years was exactly as you described the quality of the wood itself you could have probably run a tank into it and oh, it yeah. wouldn't have collapsed uh, i took four years of high school shop classes and i've assembled a lot of consumer products and I apply a lot of torque to make sure that they are properly um, tightened. And yet, I remember the one that I assembled, uh, even though it was on wheels and on a hardwood floor, there was a flimsiness to it just in the way that it stood there that I don't remember in the one that my parents owned. Um, a as a parent, uh, can you just share with us where Bobby was in, in the number of children you had? Was this the first child you had this crib for, the second, the third? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, no, this, we had uh, the crib for my daughter, um, and at the time she was... Well, we bought it for her when she was born. Right. But, and when my son started using it, um, I guess, it was three years later, and... Um, we never took the crib apart. Uh, just, I remember putting it together. Um, I, I <laughs> you know, you try and tighten everything down as tight as you can. And, you know, when you go and buy a crib, they got all these safety labels on it. Maybe you have a false sense of security. And at that point, we never realized that there were all these problems with these cribs. You just, it just wasn't out there. If it was, we would have never bought one. And, you and I think that's a very important piece here. And Congress's voice is going to be huge in this. Getting the word out to, to everybody that has these cribs. They could be in the garage, um, up in the attic, and they go to bring it back out for a newborn in the family. They need to throw those out. They're no good. And I think the voice of Congress is going to be huge in this. Um, Mrs. Arigliano, I want to talk to you about um, the safety certification on cribs in the marketplace because a lot of parents, a lot of young parents are constantly trying to educate themselves about product safety. They want to buy products that are going to take care of their children. We've seen uh, information in preparation for this hearing that the thing that makes a crib unique, it is one of the few devices that an infant uses where you expect that child to be safe absent the constant attention of a parent. That's the whole underlying premise for having a crib, so that you can go to sleep yourself at night with the confidence that child is going to wake up healthy and alive in the morning. Right. So um, one of the things we know is that most manufacturers who sell cribs in this country use this uh, certification, meeting voluntary safety standards through the Juvenile Product Manufacturing Association, that they certify with a seal on the product that it's been tested by independent labs and meets all current and mandatory voluntary safety requirements. And if you look up here on the screen, I believe this is the seal that is used. Is that your understanding? Yes. Yes. So was this crib that you bought for your daughter originally and that was used by Bobby, was, did that bear this seal? It looks very familiar. I'm not sure exactly, but I know it did have two seals on it. And that was one of the things that we were looking for when we went to go purchase a crib.
And when you look for that and see it on there as parents, what does that say to you? It's safe. It's been tested. Uh, Gives you a sense of security. Would it surprise you to learn that the cribs involved in these latest CPSC recalls were certified by JPMA as meeting all applicable safety standards? It, it wouldn't surprise me, no. Uh, in your opinion, as parents who have purchased this product, what value does that certification seal have to parents? Now yes. or when we purchase the cream? Now. <laughs> it has no value right now. And um, why is that? Because I mean, we've been doing a lot of research and it seems like, I mean, you're looking at millions and millions and millions of cribs that have been recalled. And the reasons for the recalls, you know, just little pieces of plastic that, and springs. I mean, you know, how long does, is, is um, a spring reliable? Are you talking about a spring and a plastic piece that are exactly what you use in a, a big pen? It's basically the size of what it is. And how long does a big pen last? And, and I would think a majority of families do not go out and buy a new crib every time a new child is born. Most families no, they don't. buy one crib and they, you know, use it through the length of all of their children. Well, I couldn't agree more, and Mr. Chairman, I hope that we will use this hearing as a way to identify ways to improve this safety certification process to protect the rights of consumers and the safety of infants. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Braley. Uh, Mr. Bird, just for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for being here. I, I think you've already answered this uh, with Mr. Braley, but this was a crib that, that you had purchased new yourselves? Yes. So this was not a hand-me-down. It was it was one that you had. Um, and was this crib? Did it end up on a recall list? Yes. Yes. How did how did you receive the notice of the recall? By watching television. <laughs> so it was after the fact. Yes. You, right. Now I think. Mr. Sigurdsson, you you reference this the, the way the data is managed, the way the data is collected is is obviously critical, and the CPSC are, is trying to build a registry. So clearly, that would be something that would be helpful. And yet, I get the impression from listening to your testimony that with the uh, with the drop side design, that even the registry is is really insufficient. It's the design itself of the drop side. Is that, that correct? That's my belief. Yes. And yet, the drop size presumably developed at some point because someone thought it would be worthwhile to save wear and tear on mom's back as baby gets bigger and bigger and bigger to be able to change him, attend him, and move him in and out. So there may be a trade-off there, but at the same time, it ought not to be safety, ought not to be the thing that we, that we trade off. And I agree with Mr. Braley, consumers need to be informed about uh, about the potential dangers of the drop side, if that indeed is what they're going to purchase, there are advantages, but there are uh, there are disadvantages as well. Um, do you think if CPSC had had a registry when when your crib was recalled, do you think that would that have been helpful to to you all? I'm worried that we don't get the word out. Now you bought your crib new, so if there were a warranty card that 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 you returned or a website that you registered. That's one of the things we struggled with when we did 4040, the big uh, improvement act on consumer product safety that we did a year or two ago. But I will tell you, I'm not good about those warranty cards myself. And, and as I remember cribs from when my kids were little, my wife's dad got a crib down from the attic in Arkansas and brought it down to Texas. And that was our crib for a couple of years. And then it went on to its next life in another uh, her sister's home for a while, and I don't know where that crib is today, but I think it's still probably in, in circulation out there. I, I've, I don't know how, you know, if that crib were on a recall list, I don't know how the, the folks would ever know. Where that becomes important is in the resale industry, the Goodwills, the Christian Community Action stores in my district that do great work for providing low-cost products to to young families who don't have the wherewithal to go out and buy new products, how do you get that information to them? And that's one of the things that we struggled with when we did when we did 4040. And I guess listening to you today, sir, it would just be if a resale shop has a drop side crib, they need to be very, very circumspect about whether or not they, they go ahead with a resale to, to another family because the 
at least the more recent product, product manufacturer has, uh, has, has left you feeling that there's, there's going to be some danger involved in that product. Am I overstating that? No, I agree. I, I definitely think there's going to be danger. That's, that's why we feel like the, the ban is very important. And we've been doing a lot of media and word of mouth. I'm small, but I have a large mouth when it comes to this. <laughs> and I make sure that every person I talk to, and, and sometimes I feel I'm being a little hurtful to the pregnant mom that I'm walking up to by explaining my story to her. But I think that's the only way to get it out there. Well, let me just ask you, and um, when you heard my, my opening statement about whether or not these uh, safety standards be voluntary or mandatory, what, do you have a, a, a feeling about that? Should the I, standards be voluntary? I think they should be mandatory. And uh, the last question I have, but again, you already answered it. What would you fix about the drop side crib? Well, you, you'd fix it by not having it. <laughs> Probably fix it with an ax. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we say we would break them, burn them, and throw them away. And uh, yet, you know, the, the, the cribs that <laughs> I, I, I can't even tell you the crib that my kids were in was probably manufactured in the 1930s. And, and like Mr. Braley's experience, it, I mean, I tried hard, I think, to destroy it trying to fit in the back of U-Hauls right. over <laughs> several moves. Um, and that thing was, I mean, it, it, you, you just couldn't destroy it. I, I think we have to be careful how we proceed. Mr. Chairman, we got into a lot of difficulty with the unintended consequences when we did that big 4040 bill. I got motorcycle dealers in my district who sell youth motorcycles and they're banned from selling them in case the kid eats the battery. He could get lead poisoning. I mean, that's ridiculous. And, uh, and we haven't gone back and fixed that. Um, so I do want us to be careful at the same time. I mean, here's a problem. I've got a list of, of crib recalls going back to the 70s. 2 million in 2009, 1 million in 2007, 104,000 in 2005, 6,097. 1,600,086, 400,079, 70,078. I mean, clearly there's a problem here that we need to solve. All right, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thanks, Mr. Burgess. And on some of those, and most people don't eat batteries, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's really <laughs> necessarily the law, but maybe the way we apply it. And, and that's the reason why for testimony of Sir Glianos and others are very helpful in this suggestion. I, I agree with you. Some of the applications of law passed have not been the best by any administration. And it's part of our job to make sure they're done properly. Mr. Green for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, hearing both from Congressman Brady and Congressman Burgess, uh, when our now, she'll be five years old, February 1st, when she was, um, my daughter was expecting, I went up to the attic and got our crib from our children, which was the 1970s. My wife explained to me very quickly that, the, you know, they were too far apart. and. Uh, Instead of putting it out on the curb, I actually took a sledgehammer to it so nobody else could use it. And that's what bothers me, I guess, because, you know, I was going to try and use them from generation to generation. Um, it doesn't work. Our grandchildren actually stay in a pack and play uh, <laughs> when, when they come to our house. Uh, but I want to go to the instructions that, uh, that you all received, because the child, who the seven-month-old in Houston who passed away, the parents actually put the uh, rail upside down. And... Um, and did you have problems with the instructions? Having put together lots of stuff, uh, it, it sometimes is real difficult. And don't torque it too much because you might have to take it off and put it back together again. Uh, did you have problems with the instructions? I don't remember having problems with the instructions. But the one thing I found odd was our, instru our instructions were on the mattress board. That's the board that is put under the mattress. Yeah. So you're actually putting... The instructions in place and then I just remember <laughs> I mean it was just the oddest thing and I, I to this day can't believe that that was that was done it wasn't a piece of paper it was on a mattress board and um, at least they could do is make it on the upside so you can right. read it, right it was it, it was together. pretty bizarre yeah. and I think that's something that I read that's another problem get, yeah. that they need to make sure that mm -hmm. one they're easily readable but they're also uh, common sense wise that you have it so yes. and, and again for your loss of your child like I said we've had three in the Houston area over the last few years we know, we know. it's, it's, uh, it's uh, what a tragedy uh, it's, and I yield back my time Mr. Chairman thank you Mr. Green uh, Ms. Kahelski for questions please I'll, uh, I'll pass on on questions um, 
but I just really, really want to thank you for informing us with what is probably the most compelling testimony of all, and that's uh, your personal experiences and your uh, advice. Um, I, I think the right now um, there's some voluntary standards about not having any drop side um, cribs. We want to make sure that they're uh, eliminated from the uh, marketplace. So. No one else has your experience, and I admire you from for going up to uh, to pregnant women. <laughs> Maybe the most important piece of advice that they get during their uh, during their pregnancy, and uh, you know, being pushy in that sense is a really good <laughs> thing. So, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Sutton. For questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you very much for your testimony for coming forward today. Um, we're so sorry for, you. for your loss. And um, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for holding this hearing because, um, you know, it, it's, it's clear with millions of cribs being recalled because of problems with drop sides, it's time for the CPSC to take action to protect the infants and address millions of parents' concerns. It's, you know, we have a responsibility to act to ensure that parents can lay their infant down without fear in their crib. And I'm deeply concerned also that when we hear about problems, oftentimes um, products that are recalled were manufactured in other countries. Mm -hmm. And um, it's unconscionable when companies and importers pay more attention to costs than to our safety. Product safety has to always be the primary focus. And so parents, as I said, should not have to worry about laying their infant child um, in, in a crib and being exposed to, to grave danger. And so while we're happy that recalls um, advise parents, uh, but it's after the danger you know, is present and identified. Uh, the products need to be safe uh, when they're manufactured and put on a store shelf. Now, Mr. Chairman, one of the reasons why I appreciate this hearing and your testimony also is that um, it sort of draws attention to, to this problem where we have products coming in that consumers assume are living up to our safety standards, right. and they may not even know that it's impossible to subject foreign manufacturers to U.S. law. And um, I'm, I'm going to be introducing soon a bill called the Foreign Manufacturers Legal Accountability Act to protect American consumers and businesses from, perfect, from defective products manufactured abroad, because we need to make sure that the products are being consumed in this country are safe for consumption. So thank you again for your testimony. We are very, very sorry for your loss, um, but thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both for being here, uh, and thanks for your testimony and, and really helping us understand the issue more. And uh, we're gonna continue with this hearing. You're welcome to stay if you'd like, uh, but we'll dismiss you now. And uh, thanks again, and thanks for working with us. Thank you thank for you. having us. Thank you. Okay, our next panel of witness, on our second panel, we have Nancy A. Coles, Coles, excuse me, Executive Director, Kids in Danger, and Michael Dwyer, Executive Director, Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association, if they'd come forward. It's the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do you wish to be represented by counsel? No. Mr. Dwyer, Ms. Coles? No. Both indicate it not, then I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand, take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and matter pending before this subcommittee? I do. Yes. Let the record reflect both our witnesses answer in the affirmative. They are now under oath. We would ask for an opening statement of five minutes. Uh, if you have a longer statement and supporting documents, we'll be happy to make it part of the record. Uh, Ms. Coles, would you like to go first? Sure. Would you want to just pull that mic up, press that button, and... Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Walden, and committee members. First, let me thank this committee. I don't think the mic's on. Try her again. 
No, the light there we on. go. There we, that's much better. Let me thank the House Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations for holding this very important hearing on crib safety and for giving us the opportunity to participate. I do have a much lengthier statement, which I believe I've already submitted, um, so I will read very briefly through a shorter statement for this purpose. Kids in Danger is a nonprofit organization. We're based in Chicago, dedicated to protecting children by improving children's product safety. As Congresswoman Chikowsky mentioned, we were founded in 1998 after the parents of Dan by the parents of Danny Kayser, who was killed in a portable crib at his child care location. Even though the home had just been inspected days before, the crib had been recalled five years earlier. It already killed four children, um, and yet uh, there was no publicity. That no one knew that it was recalled in that home. And our mission um, is to prevent this from happening to other children, to promote the development of safer children's products, advocate for children, and educate the public about these important issues. And I think it's been said, the crib is first and foremost a safety device. Cribs are the only children's product that is made to leave a child unattended, so that, as someone so aptly said, you can get a few hours sleep yourself. But concerns about this issue are not new. Crib durability, more strenuous testing, hardware failures, assembly problems have been raised at almost every one of the voluntary standard setting meetings that I've attended since I joined that body in 2001. And yet there has been, until very recently, little or no change to the standard for years. And the mandatory standard has been stuck even farther back in time. Any new changes at all were made to the voluntary standard. Even the vital safety message measure of banning corner posts on cribs, which led to many deaths, does not appear in the current federal standard. The failure of the voluntary system to adequately protect children is what led Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky to first introduce the legislation that's now in the CPSIA, calling for stronger mandatory standards and third-party testing, back in 2001. Had we done it then, we may have a different outcome to Susan and um, Rob's story here. So it isn't that the problem wasn't known, rather it is CPSC lack the resources and authority and manufacturers lack the will to strengthen the standards. Now, with a statutory requirement in the CPSIA, we will be seeing a strong standard. As has been mentioned, since September 2007, over 7 million cribs have been recalled by the CPSC. Most were tested to the voluntary standard and certified by the Juvenile Products Manufacturers Association. Many were recalled for hardware failures, drop side failures, but some were recalled for clear violations of the mandatory standard. They were painted with lead paint, or they simply did not meet the required dimensions. If manufacturers are making cribs that don't meet standards that can be confirmed with a tape measure and a lead test swab, then how can we expect that they can be safe in terms of design to keep babies safe unattended? This current situation leaves parents in a horrible position. We often get calls from parents asking for advice, what to do, especially as they hear about all these new recalls. We can be of limited help. We can't say to look for the JPMA label, even though it does indicate some minimum testing, since all of the recalled cribs primarily were certified to that, to that uh, standard. We can say to stay away from drop side cribs, but there's also incidents with mattress supports, hardware failure, and breaking crib slats. And the last thing any of us want is for parents to get the idea that other safe places are safer for their baby than a crib. Babies are safest in a safe crib. And that is why this is so urgent that we solve this problem now. Let me briefly talk about consumer use of crib. Parents will use a crib for more than one child. They will pass them on to their sister or friends and sell them secondhand. Doesn't mean it's a 20-year-old crib they're passing on. It could be a two- or a three-year-old crib. Um, I think we can assume that if someone spends, uh, you know, up to $1,000 on a product, they aren't going to use it for two years and then throw it out. It is not consumer misuse when a crib is assembled, taken apart, and reassembled more than once. In addition to military families, I was an Air Force brat myself, who move frequently, other families move and many parents on the advice of their doctors start with the crib in their bedroom and then need to move it to the child's bedroom later on. In these tough economic times and in the midst of a growing green mindset, Manufacturers should expect that this is what will happen to their products. They will be used for more than one child or even more than just two children in a row. So if a crib can't handle being re reassembled, it should not be sold. If the crib falls apart, losing screws or the little safety plugs or has a drop side that won't stay up, parents are going to try to fix it. They aren't engineers and they do not clearly understand the risk of that action. We need to give parents a crib that lasts, hardware that 
doesn't fall out in clear instructions on how to use that product. We are glad that CPSC is finally moving to a strong mandatory standard in our written stand statement. We have a lot of suggestions for that. But I would just like to again talk about the misassembly. Far from seeing misassembly as solely a consumer use product problem, I would assert that products designed in such a way that parts can be assembled in more than one way, including ways that lead to death, is a design problem and not a consumer misuse problem. As I said, I have specific things, but I'd also like to just mention the public consumer incident database that the CPSC is working on because I think that will also be very important for the safety. That way, parents can get the information themselves. If they're about to buy a crib or have a problem with their crib, they can find other people have the same problem. So I applaud CPSC for moving ahead with that. And secondly, I have something I would suggest for this committee, and that's the big problem is recall effectiveness. These cribs remain out there once they're recalled. So of the 7 million cribs recalled, more than half of them are probably still in use. Um, we need to improve recall effectiveness. One way you could help do that is to require CPSC to report to you annually on their recall effectiveness for each of their recalls. Each manufacturer is required to, to file a monthly corrective action report that says how many consumers have contacted them, how many products they've replaced or fixed. If that information was public, right now it's a very difficult FOIA process to get it. I think that alone would make manufacturers work much harder to get those products out of use. So again, thank you so much today. I appreciate it, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer, your opening statement, please, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Walden, and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about crib safety. The timing of this hearing is fortuitous since my fellow witness Nancy Coles and I just spent two very productive days at the CPSC developing the new voluntary standard for full-size cribs, which the CPSC is hoping to promulgate later this year as a new federal standard. JPMA has long advocated the adoption of the more expansive ASTM F1169 as a mandatory federal standard. At the behest of Chairman Tenenbaum, Juvenile Products Manufacturers, ASTM, and consumer advocacy groups have worked with CPSC technical staff to update CPSC crib regulations. This rulemaking comes on the heels of similar rulemakings for infant walkers, bath seats, and upcoming rulemakings on toddler beds and bassinets and cradles. These rulemakings are all occurring pursuant to Section 104 of the CPSIA, passed by Congress in 2008, with extensive input from the full committee. JPMA has been working and will continue to work collaboratively with all stakeholders towards our common goal of promoting the safest and most effective juvenile product safety standards in the world. Our members produce products that help prevent injuries to our children. While tragic accidents often occur or may occur, these products save many lives. As an example, child restraint seats or car seats save an untold number of children's lives in motor vehicle accidents. Similarly, cribs have helped assure that children are placed safely to sleep. JPMA offers a certification program to manufacturers who are willing to have their products tested to ASTM standards by independent third-party CPSC accredited laboratories. The certification program was created in 1976 when manufacturers approached ASTM through the association about setting a voluntary safety standard for high chairs. That standard has evolved, but it is still in effect today. Since then, JPMA has expanded the certification program to cover 19 additional products with two more pending. ASTM is one of the largest voluntary standards development organizations in the world with over 22,000 members worldwide. ASTM standards are developed on a consensus basis by all interested parties. Any reputable stakeholder can join a standards development committee and vote on all aspects of the standard. Every standards development committee member with a vote can influence this process. For years, JPMA has worked alongside consumer advocacy organizations such as Consumers Union, the Consumer Federation of America, Keeping Babies Safe and Kids in Danger on the development of a variety of juvenile product standards, including the full-size crib standard. The first federal full-size crib standard was promulgated in 1973, as we heard earlier, and ASTM developed its first full-size crib standard in 1988. The voluntary standard fully incorporated the federal standard and added numerous performance testing requirements, including corner post height restrictions and additional warning labels and instructional requirements. Since then, it has been modified multiple times to address emerging hazards, including last December's modifications, which eliminated traditional drop sides and established crib slat integrity criteria and testing procedures. F1169 has been extremely eff effective. During a 2007 hearing on the CPSIA, the CPSC testified to an 89% reduction in crib-related fatalities due to the establishment and effectiveness of the voluntary standard. The federal standard has been updated once since its, since its inception 37 years ago. The CPSC has 
relied on the ASTM voluntary standard as the best tool for promoting crib safety in the marketplace. JPMA's certification program provides consumers the best way to know that their crib meets both the mandatory and the voluntary standards. Here's how the program works. A manufacturer must apply to participate in the program and agree to have all of its models in a product category tested to the applicable ASTM standard. We do not test products ourselves, nor do we maintain our own standards. JPMA relies on the experts at independent, third-party CPSC-accredited labs to verify compliance to the applic applicable ASTM standard. JPMA has never used or promoted its own safety standards. All products, including full-size cribs bearing the JPMA certification logo, must meet all parts of the applicable ASTM standard. Achieving compliance, however, is just the beginning of a manufacturer's obligation under the program. Manufacturers must also submit to ongoing testing. This testing occurs quarterly for at least 25% of their models so that all models are tested at least once per year. In addition, an independent third-party CPSC accredited laboratory pulls JPMA certified products at random from retail shelves and tests those products for compliance. JPMA is proud of our role in promoting safe sleep for the most vulnerable segment of our population. According to First Candle, one of the nation's leading nonprofit organizations dedicated to safe pregnancy and the survival of babies through the first years of life, there are about 4,700 incidents each year involving infant sleep environments. At least 80% involve parents and caregivers putting their children in an unsafe place outside the crib. A properly assembled, fully functional, ASTM-compliant crib remains the safest place for our babies to sleep. Unfortunately, tragic accidents can occur with improperly assembled, second use, or heirloom cribs. We believe that better information and education can help reduce these rare fatalities involving missing hardware or improperly assembled or reassembled cribs. That is why JPMA has designated Safe Sleep as the, th the theme for this year's Baby Safety Month, which takes place in the ninth month of each year. JPMA is working with the CPSC, our retail partners, and any interested consumer safety advocacy groups to promote safe crib assembly and safe sleep practices. JPMA welcomes all efforts in this regard. Again, I thank you for your op the opportunity to be up here today. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to questions from members. Uh, Ms. Coles, let me ask you, in, in your statement, and, and explain a little bit more on page two and going on top page three, you talk about the corner post of the crib. In fact, both of you mentioned the corner post of the crib. And, and then you go on to say, top of page three, at the same time, the mandatory standard has been struck in time as well. All new changes have been made to the voluntary standard. Even the vital safety measure of banning corner posts on crib was integrated into the ASTM voluntary standard as not pure in the federal standard. So it was mandatory and now it's voluntary and no. No, it was never mandatory. It's always been in the in the voluntary standard. Uh, that they first started, as uh, Mr. Dwyer mentioned, that standard was passed in 1988, but they first started working on it in 1984 right. after unfortunately an another child named Danny died uh, when right. he strangled on his corner post of his bed. So, so it was. It's always been in the voluntary standard. So, so right now I, I can make a crib. I could have this post here. It's a voluntary standard, not to do it. You could have it. You would, you would probably have difficulty if you wanted to sell it through traditional retailers sure. who probably wouldn't take it, but certainly with the extent of the Internet and CPSC would probably recall it if they got it, but you could certainly try and sell it. It does not violate the mandatory standard. Okay. does not violate the mandatory standard. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dwyer, let me ask you this. Uh, the Consumer Products Manufacturer Association, we just call it JPMA, uh, is a trade association represents the manufacturers of children products, of course. You offer your members a certification, as you testified, and there's a fee for that certify that certifies a product, such as a crib, meets all applicable mandatory standards, as well as voluntary standards of the ASTM, correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. The JPMA then encourages its members to use your CO of approval. I think we had it on the board there at one time. And, and then they're advertising to show consumers that they are JPMA certified. I want to show you this ad. I think it's in tab 11 there. If you want to look at it right there in the book in front of you. In, in this uh, ad, JPMA ran in several magazines for, for new parents. Uh, this ad says, and I quote, be confident that juvenile products you purchased are designed and built with safety in mind. What does safety in mind mean in, in the ad? That parents can be assured that the products that we certify meet the applicable voluntary and mandatory standards for those products. Okay. In a way, it would be safe to say you're certifying the cribs as being safe then? 
we're verifying that the manufacturers who meet at ASTM along with all other stakeholders to discuss incident data. Ms. Coles mentioned the right. uh, NICE data that's used to drive the activity of the committee. And if there are issues related to a product concern, that they address those and incorporate those into the standard and that the manufacturers meet those standards. So, so what you're really saying is you've, we've met all the standards. This product meets the standards, whether voluntary or mandatory. We're not verifying safety, just that the standards are met. Is that what we're saying? We, we believe that by meeting all of the standards that the products are safe and that manufacturers take into account certainly the safety of the, their ultimate uh, customers, our, our babies, when they build these products. Okay. The ad goes on, and again, I, I want to quote from the ad. It says, buying a JPM certified product in any of the below categories ensures that the product has gone through an extra set of rigorous testing. Uh, over the past several years, and we've heard testimony today, Cribs involved in some of the largest recalls, Simplicity, Delta, Storkcraft Cribs, all earned a JPMA seal of safety certification. So, so my, my question, Mr. Dwyer, would be, has JPMA changed the requirements for a certification program in light of the recalls we've seen? In fact, even Tuesday we had one of 635 cribs. Have you changed the certification that would be found in this ad? Or? Well, just to make sure everybody's clear, the certification is a verification that they meet the standard. Correct. The standard, as the standard changes, the certification changes in as much as that that's what it is. It's a verification to the change in the standard. I'm not quite sure I understand. Since the, the recalls, question. I guess, ma'am, started in 28 and 209, mm -hmm. Storkcraft had two big large recalls in 209. Yes. Have those standards changed all? The, as AS, the ASTM standards? Yes. Um, the standard changed with a recent change in December okay. that would ban the drop sides and also added a slat integrity test and requirements to the CRIB standard as well So in December of 2009. So when you certify now, so when you run this ad, that means the slat has been changed and, and what's the, the no, no more drop side, right? It verifies that the CRIBs meet the standards. However, the certification program does allow for a 180-day sell-throughs period. So okay. we will certify to the new version of the standard six months after it's been implemented. When, when it was six months up? It will be in June. in June. I don't know the exact date. Right. But I, I do know that manufacturers, at this point, to move product out of the marketplace, they are no longer manufacturing job side products. Right. But they're, just so we're clear, so we have until June, so there still could be drop side cribs out there right now for sale with the JPMA uh, certification because they have until June 180 days, right? That is correct. Okay. I guess my time's up, Mr. Walden. Questions? And that would be unless CSPC recalls that. That is correct. So there's, so there's that would be the only check then is if if there is a identified problem, then CSPC could step in, issue a recall, and take those out of the market place. But parents may still have those cribs, legacy cribs, if you will. That is, that is correct. Uh, Mr. Coles, you were recently quoted in the press as saying the same problems have existed for 10 years, and nothing's been done, and we're glad to see that it's now a crisis and people are acting. Do you want to talk about that quote? Sure. So nothing's been done in 10 years? Well, I have sat on the ASTM committee since 2001, and there have been other consumers who have been on those committees before right. that. And in those committee meetings, the same issues that we're talking about here today, the same issues we talked about the last two days where we actually finally made real progress, such as putting in a test that's been in Canada during all that time. It's called a racking test. It, it subjects the, t the crib to much more rigorous shaking and testing, much more similar like to what a child, child might do. Okay. Um, and we have asked repeatedly since 2001 to add that test to the, to the J ASTM standard, and it was never added. So on the ASTM standards, uh, and, and your committee, I'm not familiar with how that operates. How many members are on that committee? Uh, Mike might know better than I do. I would Fire, say around 50, but I'm... Oh, well, I would say actively participating in F15, it's at least 50. Yeah. So and 50 members, 15 that actually participate? 50. 50. 50. 5 yep. zero, okay. correct. Yep. And, and during that nine-year period that, that you've been on it, and, and this has been an issue floating around, have there been recommendations then that have gone forward that you voted against because they're not uh, strong enough or yes. are you okay and you're that, as one of the sometimes three sometimes four consumers in the room out of those 50 our votes unfortunately did not go too far could I just follow yeah, up on Mr. that Garsh. I mean and again I don't 
I'm not representing ASTM. They're not here at the table. Understood. But uh, I do participate in the process as, as Nancy does. And uh, you know, anybody who participates in that process has the opportunity to cast a negative vote on any ballot. Right. And if that ballot is, uh, if that argument is found persuasive through the ASTM process, it is, can be upheld. And modifications can be made to the ballot before the final rule is issued. Uh -huh. I just want to be very clear that everybody that participates in the process has an equal vote in that process. Okay. And then, uh, Mr. Dwyer, I wanted to, in, in light of recent events, do these uh, companies like Storecraft lose their membership status in your organization? No, they would not lose their membership status. The certification program is a separate and, 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 and apart from membership in the organization. Okay. So same for Delta and other uh, brands that are JPMA certified? Correct. Okay, so they can still be a member. Correct. Um, okay, even though they have these, these re in, in your testimony, JPMA lists over 20 product categories that are currently in your certification programming, including cribs and infant carriers. Which products should CPSC uh, list as their top priorities for safety issues uh, and uh, issue safety standards for as soon as possible? In, in my opinion, sir, which yeah. products? I would say cribs, and that's why we spent two days and why the chairman reached out to the manufacturers and the consumer groups and, and, and asked us, as I testified, to p please help us accelerate rulemaking on full-size cribs. Okay. And, Ms. Coles, are, are, are you satisfied with the new recommendations that came out in December? Um, I think banning drop side cribs is an important step. However, the real problem with drop sides, as the family testified, is the hardware failures using plastic hardware. Right. And those hardware pieces are still in other parts of the crib, so we do believe we still need this stronger racking test to test hardware for durability. And that, in fact, has was is being talked about in the, the meetings that we've been to. So we are satisfied that the new mandatory standard will have sufficient uh, strength in it once we get to that point. And, and did you all vote then on this new standard that came out in December? Yeah. Not, not yet. The process. No, December, he's asking. In December. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, did I you apologize. both support that then? Yes. Okay. I abstain from voting on the ASTM committees. We support an administrative role, but I, I do support the activities. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, I think that's, well, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Uh, uh, the manufacturing problems, I think, is, is probably the issue we're all kind of looking at here. What should be done there? In terms of the manufacturing of the product itself, well, I, I would submit, and I will talk to that, brief, but just let me briefly say, many of these are design issues, if you design right. a product with bad hardware. But, but manufacturing, and I think one of the reasons the older cribs that people are talking about as having seemed to have, have held up well were made under the same lax regulations, but were made you know, here under, under our. So I think the manufacturing plays a role, and I'm hoping that both J, JPMA CPSC in their oversight role, uh, you know, work to make sure that, you know, if you choose to make a product overseas that you're selling to American consumers, you need to make sure it's as safe as if you made it here. That's really the manufacturer's responsibility. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer, do you want to comment on that? Uh, manufacturers of these products are incredibly responsible. Ultimately, their, their customers are our babies. Uh, I'm the father of three children. I used a drop side crib that was handed down to me by a friend of a friend disassembled it three times, put it together three times, took care to follow the instructions every time. And, and manufacturers, this ultimately, children's lives are the, the most precious commodity. And I believe manufacturers have always had that. You know, if I interrupt you just a second, the, the, the family behind you made the comment about the instructions being on the, the bottom of the mattress or bottom of the slat. And, and sort of glued on there. Right. Is that done so that it continues on if somebody Cor takes it apart? Because I don't know anybody that keeps the instructions for anything we put together. Correct. It is, it, is, uh, it, it is part of the standard because just that, so that the instructions don't get lost. If the crib is handed down or if it's it. disassembled in between each child, which a product should be made to be able to be disassembled multiple times, as Nancy indicated, uh, and the instructions are on there so they don't get lost, correct? So that's why they're glued on correct. there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I've exceeded my time. Thanks for your courtesy. No, thank you, Mr. Wald. Mr. Braley, for questions? Yeah, Mr. Dwyer, I want to follow up that last comment you made. Manufacturers of these products are incredibly responsible. You stand by that statement. I do. In the statement you submitted, it indicates that your a manufacturers association has grown to include more than 250 member companies in the United States, Canada, and Mexico 
and that these companies manufacture and or import infant products. Correct. So do you have members that are manufacturers in China and Vietnam? No, we do not. Okay. That, that, that actually are manufacturers in the country or manufacture in those countries. Right. But my point is, since you have the word import in there, I assume some of your members are importing products that are being manufactured, and that is who the manufacturer is you're referring to when you said manufacturers are incredibly responsible. The manufacturers that are members of the association must have a place of business in North America, but yes, some of them do manufacture their products overseas or import their products from overseas, and yes. Right, and isn't it customary that the inspections that you rely upon are done at the point of manufacturing? The inspections for the certification program? Yes. They are done both domestically and overseas. Okay, and you're aware that it's much more difficult to ensure the integrity of those inspection processes when they're being done in a country like China, which has very strict controls on access. Um, I, our members take great care to visit with their factories overseas every year and to make sure that quality control practices are taking place at, at the highest levels. Have you ever tried to serve a Chinese manufacturer of a defective product that's marketed in the United States? Serve? Serve for legal process. No, I have not. Do you know what's involved in that process? I, I do not, sir. Do you know that international treaties have to be complied with and that service has to be performed domestically through the Chinese government that erects roadblocks that can prolong the actual accountability of foreign manufacturers who are selling defective products in this country for years and years if you are ever successful? I, I'm not familiar with that process, sir. Do you, are you aware that certain states, like my home state of Iowa, have domestic laws that provide immunity to sellers of products, like some of your members, if the manufacturer is accountable and can be served and that may put you into this endless limbo of trying to get service in a country that doesn't want its manufacturers to be served. And that's exactly what Representative Sutton is talking about in this bill she's about to introduce. Are you familiar with that problem from your work with these many people selling products that affect infants' lives and safety in this country? No, sir, but you know our program is built with safety in mind, and we have testing. We have multiple testing. We had multiple testing before the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act was even implemented. Our program, Section 104, the requirements of certification are more robust, and they mirror what the, this Congress, what this committee has put together. I, I'm not familiar with challenges with serving Chinese manufacturers with, uh, you know, warrants for, for defective products, but we're here to talk about our certification program, the ASTM standards. Well, in your certification program, have you ever encountered incidents where the instructions on assembly are written in that country of origin, in some form of English, that would not make sense to anybody in this room, and yet is being used by the manufacturer and the subsequent seller of that product as a guide for people in assembly of that product. Are you aware that takes place? There's pretty clear guidelines, both at the voluntary and the mandatory uh, level for the standard that dictate how the instructions should be put together. And, and I am not aware that there are issues with communication on, on the instructions. It is an issue that the group is working on and looking at adding some additional warnings and looking at instructions. Eliminating moving parts would help with any disassembly issues. But I am not aware that there are any issues with, uh, issues with instructions, sir. As part of your certification requirement, do they look at the assembly instructions being supplied by the manufacturer? Yes, they do. And do they look at whether or not the language that is being used is in plain English that can be e that can be easily understood and adapted by the consumer in the assembly of that product? Well, the product in the certification program, the product has to be assembled to the manufacturer's instructions. And so that is a requirement. And well, so and that's my point. Mm -hmm. My point is the manufacturer in, in the latest recall is located in China located in Vietnam, and they sometimes have a very different understanding of the English language than American consumers putting that product together. I'm not just talking about from a professional standpoint. I'm talking from the standpoint of a parent who has assembled many of these products and is frequently mystified 
by what the intention is in the assembly process because it's obviously being written by somebody who doesn't live in this country. Are you specifically talking about the Durrell recall, the Durrell Asia yes. recall? 635,000 units? Yes. Which were not JPMA certified? And I'm well aware of extenuating circumstances in that case where that crib was put together with duct tape by parents and criminal charges were charged against those parents for endangering their, their child. And I, and I like they to bring were that filed. up before I close, Mr. Chairman, because what happens in these cases is everybody engages in finger pointing. And, and one of the first people on the line are the parents dealing with the tragic loss of their child who are frequently blamed and subject to criminal prosecutions, which are many times later dropped. And I think that it's important that if there are manufacturers profiting from the sale of these products, they take a good look in the mirror and do everything they can to address the problem, not always blame the parents. And that's why this work we're here today is so important. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Braley. It should be noted, too, on, on that case where the parents' uh, charges were brought, they were dropped. Uh, and so just so the record's clear. Uh, Mr. Burgess, when he yes, comes sir. back, I, I'll reserve his spot. We'll come back. So I guess we're to Ms. Schakowsky. Questions? I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the role of uh, parents that, that in, in November of last year, we've talked about this, but the CPSC and Storecraft, Storecraft recalled more than two million cribs due to reports of broken or missing drop side hardware. As part of that recall, Storecraft created an instructional video and posted it on YouTube. And so whoever's working on that, let's get it up there, um, to show consumers how to identify problems with their cribs and how to install the repair kits the company supplied. So if you'll play that. Before each usage or assembly, Inspect your crib for damaged hardware, loose joints, missing parts, or sharp edges. Do not use the crib if any parts are missing or broken. So let me ask you, Ms. Coles, is it responsible, or realistic rather, to expect that parents will follow this recommendation in the real world? No, I don't think any parent does that every time they put a, a baby in a crib any more than you open your hood and ch check everything before you get in your car to drive. It's certainly something that we might expect them to do occasionally, but no, I think parents assume they put together a crib, it's going to stay together. Mr. Dwyer, do you think that a tired mother or father, baby wakes up at 2 in the morning and you put the baby back in bed, is going to go around and do a crib inspection every time before putting the baby back to sleep? Having been a very tired father at one time, no, no, ma'am. So, Mr. Dwyer, the JPMA put together a frequently asked questions page about drop side cribs. It's on tab 10 of the uh, document binder. And here's what your association fact sheet says JPMA reminds parents and caregivers that when you assemble a crib to the manufacturer's instructions and use it properly, a crib provides the safest sleeping environment for a, a baby. What do you mean by, what does JPMA mean by use it properly? That is assembled according to the manufacturer's instructions. And inspect it every time, right? We would recommend that parents be aware that inspection may be needed and we are also have safe sleep guidelines for what not to put in the crib. That's part of the whole process, such as heavy blankets or pillows or that type of thing. Um, Storecraft CEO Jim Moore issued a statement after the November recall in which he asserted that parents improperly used the drop side cribs implicated in infant entrapments. Here's how the news accounts quoted Mr. Moore, quote, in the majority of instances, the cribs were being used with broken parts, parts with pieces missing, parts that were damaged, or with modified or homemade parts, unquote. Um, so, Ms. Coles, do you, what do you think of the, the Storecraft uh, response? Well, I think that it is particularly damaging uh, to the recall process, that when manufacturers come out, and as Mr. Dwyer has done here, and continue to blame the individual parent whose child either was died or was hurt, it basically says to every other parent using that crib, oh, I'm sure you don't need to worry about your crib. 
because you're a smart parent who's using it correctly. And so I think that kind of language, uh, especially after the CPSC has, has to spend time negotiating what's in the press release and they come to an agreement of what's going to be said about it, then the company comes out that later that day or the next day with those kind of damaging comments. Um, I think, again, both... Uh, discourages parents from participating with the recall because they think theirs must be okay because they obviously put it together right and downplays the problem. I mean, all that list of things, if that crib wasn't falling apart, parents wouldn't have to do any of those things. So it's the crib, I think, that we're here to talk about and not how individual parents may decide to fix a problem when their crib does, in fact, break. And, and Mr. Uh, um, Dwyer, um, what were you saying kind of, I felt, sort of self-righteously about how these parents were uh, on the Durrell uh, Asia cribs um, charged with criminal negligence or whatever it, it was. I just wanted to clarify for Mr. Braley that those products were not certified by the association and that I was, a, was aware, made aware that there were extenuating circumstances, that that crib, that there were photos of the crib that were showed duct tape holding the pieces of the crib together and that one side was broken from the crib and had been pushed against the wall. And I was aware that criminal charges had been brought for child engagement and also there were drug charges. I was not aware that those charges had been dropped. But I was specifically addressing, do not want that, those cribs that were recalled lumped into because they were not certified by the association. Did you want to comment, Ms. Cole? I just wanted to say about the charges. I know that's not why we're here today, but having worked with many parents whose children have been killed, more times than you can imagine that is at least threatened or brought before the medical examiner can uh, ascertain that the product itself was defective. So I have had parents charged with that, with, with child abuse, with all kinds of things. And so the initial charge made by the police is no indication um, of what is actually responsible for that child's death, especially in a case like this where the charges are dropped. Thank you. Ms. Sutton, for questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to follow up uh, uh, on two things. First of all, Representative Braley's um, line of questioning about foreign manufacturers. And I uh, just want to invite all of our colleagues uh, to uh, seriously consider uh, getting on this bill. It's a bipartisan bill to make sure that we can serve process and submit people who are selling products in this country um, to, uh, to the jurisdiction of our courts and the enforcement of our laws. Um, that's what I think the American people expect. And those are the consumers. Um, yes, uh, your, your customers are, are infants with parents. And they're counting on us to deliver um, uh, a, a degree of safety. So, um, what, but I also want to follow up with uh, Ms. Schakowsky's line of questioning because I think this idea of parental error versus product defect is, is an important one. And um, along the same lines, in September of 2007, CPSC recalled more than a million Simplicity brand drop side cribs in one of the many recalls of, uh, involving this company. And the CPSC noted that some consumers installed the drop side unintentionally down, upside down. In this situation, the drop side would function upside down. It would function that way. It would weaken the hardware and in some cases detach from the crib. The Storkcraft drop side cribs recalled last year had the same problem, had similar problems. So Storkcraft asserts that this drop side problem is not the company's fault. In a Storkcraft position paper provided to the committee located at tab eight in the document binder, the company states, and I quote, it is absolutely unreasonable to expect Storkcraft to reasonably foresee that a consumer would install the drop side rail upside down. Mr. Dwyer, do you agree with Storkcraft's statement? Is it unforeseeable that a consumer might improperly install the drop side upside down when the drop side will still function that way? I'm, I'm not intimately familiar enough with the product. Obviously, if the product is manufactured in such a way that it could be installed in, upside down, as was the case with this product, that um, that would be the case. I don't understand your answer. Well, your question was, is it foreseeable yes. for that product, for that rail to be installed upside down? Apparently, that is the case. That it, was, it, it, is, it, it, was not, it is foreseeable if it can be installed upside down. Okay, so you disagree with Storkcraft's statement that it is um, unreasonable to expect that to be foreseen? 
I would say based upon the information, limited information I have about this specific product as I read it here, I would say that I would disagree with that statement. Thank you. And Ms. Coles, I understand that you were a part of a task group assigned to examine the improper drop side installation after the simplicity recall. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission produced an email to the committee, which is located at tab one of the document binder, and it relates to this issue. This is an email chain between you, Jonathan Midget uh, of CPSC, and other members of the group tasked at looking at improper assembly of drop sides. Um, Dr. Midget, who is a engineering psychologist, comments as follows. The best way to prevent misassembly is to limit the consumer's ability to put parts in the wrong place. The least effective strategy is to modify the instructions or create a list of warnings. Um, to his co-workers at CPSC, Dr. Midget notes in an email that the crib industry has been, and I quote, freakish in its insistence that instructions of cribs are at fault. This only makes sense if you know uh, you don't want to change any of the shapes of your crib hardware and would rather blame the consumer, end quote. Ms. Coles, is this observation consistent with your experience negotiating crib safety standards? I think that this is very consistent both with my experience on the committees. I think I mentioned in my longer testimony that the committee will not even look at incidents that happen in cribs older than five years old, even though as we heard from the family that could have easily been a crib that was just in one place and not reassembled because they consider it old. They're, they're very quick to blame when they can uh, account things to what the consumer did rather than to their crib. Um, and again, I think as I said today, that if a product is made so you can put it together in a way that causes death, that's a design problem, not a consumer problem. Thank you, uh, Ms. Coles, and I appreciate again, Mr. Chairman, that you're holding this hearing. Um, these emails illustrate the risk of relying on voluntary industry safety standards, um, and I yield back. Thanks. If, if I may, just one question or two. Uh, I think Mr. Burgess will be here in a minute, or hopefully. We're going to have votes. Okay. Uh, let me just ask this. Mr. Wire asked about this ad that you put out saying you certify products. Yes, sir. And, and we talked about recalls. Do you ever take out similar ads in, in the same magazines advertising there's been a recall? Let's say like on the cribs? So, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Does your association, the Juvenile Products Manufacturer Association, you put out these ads advertising these products that they're certified and safe. Then when they're recalled, do you ever take out an ad saying these things have been recalled so consumers would know? No, we don't name specific products and put ads in a, in a recall in any magazine. Well, wouldn't that be a good idea? Um, I believe that's the role of the agency. We can, you know, communicate. We issued statements and we've provided statements based upon when the Storecraft products were recalled to help parents and concerned consumers understand the implications. We link to recall.gov on our website. We so other than your website, that's all you do to let parents know that? We, we do not take out ads in magazines to, to uh, promote the fact that um, uh, products are recalled. This is part of a safe sleep can or excuse me, a product safety campaign and involves uh, multiple communication. Sure, points. these are all products with your seal on it. Correct. So if, you, if your sealed products are, are, are being recalled, I would think you'd want to let people know know that we, we do target these audiences. We right? do communicate, but we don't take out ads in magazines. Okay. Do you have a question? Okay, I'd like to thank this panel for the, their uh, testimony. Thank, thank you, witnesses, and thanks for being here. As Mr. Walden reminds you, we're gonna have votes here pretty quick, so uh, let's see if we can't uh, finish up this hearing. Uh, I'll ask the chairperson to come forward, please. The Honorable Ms. Tannenbaum of the Consumer Product Safety Council. Let the record reflect that uh, before you have your opening statement, uh, it's the policy of this committee that you have the right under rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do you wish to be represented by counsel? No, sir. Okay. And then, Ms. Tannenbaum, I'm going to ask you to take the uh, as chairperson of the Consumer Product Safety Council. Uh, give the oath, please. Raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and not in the matter pending before this committee? I do. Thank you. <coughs> Let the record reflect. Ms. Tannenbaum is under oath, and please present your opening statement, please. Good morning, Chairman Stupak, Ranking Member Walden, and members of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation. The overall safety of cribs is your a... Your mic on, please. 
sir? You want to pull that up or make sure your mic is on? It's on. There it is. Okay, thank you. The overall safety of cribs is a critical concern of the CPSC and a personal priority of mine. Getting unsafe cribs off the market and out of the home is always, has always been a key part of the CPSC's mission. But I strongly believe that we must do more and have strong federal safety standards that prevent cribs with design flaws or safety defects from ever making it into the stream of commerce or into nurseries. Since the inception of the agency in 1973, the CPSC has been deeply involved in issues of crib and infant sleeping environment safety. In November 1973, the Commission promulgated the first mandatory safety standard governing full-size cribs. Since that time, the CPSC has also worked diligently with other standards developing organizations, such as the ASTM International and Voluntary Crib Standards. These mandatory and voluntary standards, combined with substantial outreach efforts, have undoubtedly prevented numerous infant and child injuries. However, one question that has arisen in some media reports is the issue of why the CPSC's mandatory crib standards have have not been revised since 1982. The main answer is that the Commission had limited authority to do so under Section 9 of the Consumer Product Safety Act. Under that section, which was, which was revised by the CPSIA, the Commission was generally required to rely on voluntary standards that was likely result in the adequate reduction of risk and injury and where there would be subst uh, substantial compliance with the standard. This reliance on voluntary standards worked well in many areas, but it also left some substantial gaps that voluntary standard development developing organizations were either unwilling or unable to confront. This provision was modified by the CPSIA to give the Commission additional authority to promulgate rules, even when a voluntary standard is in existence. In addition, the CPSIA also included Section 104, the Danny Kezar Child Product Safety Notification Act, which directs the Commission to promulgate new standards for 12 groups of durable infant and toddler products. I st strongly support these additional authorities and have directed the CPSC staff to make crib safety a key priority, starting with the immediate recall of cribs that have been shown to present a substantial risk of danger and injury to children. One example of the Commission's efforts to remove potentially hazardous cribs from the marketplace has been the two recent uh, recalls of Storkcraft dropside cribs. In January 2009, Storkcraft agreed to voluntary recall over half a million impacted cribs due to a bracket defect. At that time, the CPSC was also investigating instances regarding a potential drop side issue with the cribs. These incidents, however, involved a large population of cribs with different styles of drop side hardware and a different mode of drop side failure. After my arrival at the Commission, I, request weekly, I requested weekly Commission briefings from the Office of Compliance on pending consumer product investigations. The subject of the 2000, uh, September 24, 2009 briefing was nursery products and included the Commission's investigation into dropside cribs. During that briefing, I learned about the developing compliance case re re uh, regarding Storkcraft dropside cribs, as well as the tragic June 2009 death in Louisiana that involved a stork craft dropside crib. Following this brief briefing, I directed the staff to give immediate priority to the recall of stork craft cribs in this dropside hazard. In November 2003, I mean November 23, 2009, the Commission in Stork Craft announced the largest crib action recall in CPS history. And as you know, this involved 2.1 million stork craft. Uh, cribs. We also recently recall the uh, Durrell Asia cribs, which I will not go into detail to save time because you are very well of that uh, recall. Now, since these recalls and since my tenure as chairman, I have decided that we need a new safe sleep initiative, which has six points that I want to talk to you about. Uh, in my brief statement this morning, I'll just talk about the highlights, but then you can ask me questions later. I think the CPSC has very talented staff that has worked diligently for years uh, uh, on these issues of safe cribs. But I also think that we could have, for a variety of reasons, including funding, inadequate statutory authorities, and competing priorities, move quicker to have a mandatory uh, and, and stronger voluntary standards. And I want you to know and make very clear to this subcommittee that those days are over at the CPSC. This morning, I'm pleased to announce the, the details of the Sle Safe Sleep Initiative. First of all, you've heard from other uh, speakers that the first part of this initiative is to expedite the rulemaking and have mandatory standards under Section 104 for CRIBS. And I might want to add, <clears throat> 
that when I came to the commission, the schedule for this, crib, uh, uh, this rule for cribs was scheduled for 2012. When I learned about it, I pulled it in front of other rules and said, we have to have this standard now. Second, we are going to expand the Commission's successful early warning system by having an early warning team for bassinets, cribs, and other sleep environment for children. Three, we will uh, also increase the monitoring of recall effectiveness and corrective actions on take rates on crib recall cases. We want to know how effective are these uh, recalls. Fifth, we are going to continue with our uh, additional media outreach. For example, when we call, recall staff, Storkcraft, we estimated that 200 million people saw the television uh, clips of, the, of those recalls. And sixth, we are going to have an internal management review of how we do recalls, not only for cribs, but for other products. When I came to the Commission, I realized that the Commission needed a new strategic plan. It also needed consultants from the outside to come in and look at the operations and the management of that agency. So we went through the procurement process, and I'm pleased to announce that just recently we have um, uh, secured Booz Allen Hamilton to uh, do a top to bottom review of the CPSC and help us in this area. And uh, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Walden, I thank you for uh, having this meeting. It's very important that you show uh, everyone involved in crib safety how important it is to you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you. And let me thank you on, on behalf of the whole committee and our staffs for your work and cooperation in this area, and also for being here all morning. You've sat through all the panels, and, and we appreciate that, and, and we think that helps in what we're trying to uh, achieve here. Uh, you said uh, your sleep, safe sleep initiative, that will is starting today, and... Okay. We've already started it. It started really several weeks. And part of that, you said in your testimony, when Storkcraft was uh, announced a recall, there was 200 million people saw that. We went on every morning show to right. announce the recall, and we're using all of our social me right. media, Twitter, YouTube, CPSC 2.0, but we estimate over 200 million saw those, uh, had access to those uh, television tapes. Well, when we do a recall, when you do a recall here, especially like with Storkcraft, the 2 million that were recalled here in November, that, that's a voluntary recall, right? It is a voluntary recall. And, and, and uh, you have to convince the manufacturer to do it. You don't have authority to say, that's it, we're recalling these cribs, correct? We could if we wanted to go into an administrative action, which would probably result in litigation and take more time. Would take but more time. But the, um, the compliance officials and the lawyers at the uh, CPSC have said to me, if we can get a voluntary recall, we can get the remedy to the consumer sooner, quicker, and it sure. takes less time. But well, you have to negotiate. You have to negotiate. And, and if you look at tab seven there, I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Because you have to negotiate with the company that does not believe that their product is defective. It, right? That's correct. In fact, Storkcraft does, maintains to this day that the product is not defective. Still maintains that, even though we recalled 2 million cribs in 2009. So if, so if I look at tab 7, if I understand this correctly, starting on May 6, 2009, staff sent an email to Storkcraft advising them to stop sale of drop side cribs, right? That's correct. And then there's a number of entries in here about all the what staff was doing, conversations, discussions, and that wasn't really completed until about October 9th. Storecraft submits a press release, and then you have negotiations of the press release begins. That's correct. So it takes you about six months to convince them to do a recall, correct? It just depends on the circumstances. But in this one, it took about it six took months. It took about six months. And, and, and then why do we begin negotiations of a press release? Uh, that's October, October 9th, and it's my understanding, again, I got another whole page of all the <laughs> entries that went through in trying to negotiate a press release on a recall, which infant children possibly die because of defects in these cribs, and that takes us to press release issuance of October, um, excuse me, November 24th. So that's another six weeks. You negotiate six weeks for a press release. That is correct. We negotiate every word of that press release. We're required to under 6B with the company. Now, we, uh, 6B under the CPSCIA was amended, which gives us more flexibility, but we negotiate press releases. 
and, and, and um, six weeks here. You know, being where I sit, and maybe I'm just a little skeptical of me, but this is sort of like the Christmas season. That's when people are buying things. Do you think part of the negotiations to drag out the press release, a one-page press release for six weeks, is to get into the Christmas season to sell more cribs that are defective, that are being recalled? Well, I've asked my um, staff why it takes so long to, uh, once you've made the decision for recall, why it takes six weeks. And that is the standard procedure, the standard amount of time. And they produced a document for me with everything that has to be done. Particularly if you're going to do a recall repair, you have to manufacture the repair, you have to test it. We ha and then sure. inside the company, in Storkcraft Company, you know, those decisions, if you're talking to someone, they have to run it all the way up to the CEO or whomever is at the level to make the decision. But it is the truth. I mean, it, uh, it takes an inordinate amount but of time. And, and, and it, uh, all during this time, the consumers don't know that their crib needs a repair kit. Correct. And then even after you do the recall, now this is well over six months, though, when we started this process, and you six weeks to get a press release out. But then now on top of that, they have another six months they can sell the product to the American people, right? Don't they no, have we six stop months? sale. Once the, recall, uh, once the recall is uh, announced, we stop sale. In fact, the retailers um, have a way to, uh, in their computers, put the uh, number, serial number of the product, and it stops Okay, sale. I thought from Mr. Air Dwyer, I thought we had another 680 days after that. Maybe I missed it. No, after the, uh, if the recall, it stops sale. That's the certification, I guess. Okay, I had it wrong. But wh why does it take so long? I well, mean, you had a number of recalls. In fact, you had one Tuesday here, 635 more cribs. Why does it take so long? Why does it take six months? I mean, well, it shouldn't take six months, and that is why under our Safe Sleep Initiative, we are uh, going forward going to have a safe sleep team where right. everyone works together, the compliance officers, the attorneys, the epidemiologists, the engineers, so that we can all work together to move a case forward quicker. Uh, I think six months personally is too long, and uh, you can also, if the company is not cooperating and keeps insisting uh, that, you know, uh, they shouldn't have a recall, we can uh, uh, issue a unilateral press release, which we have threatened to do. I've also told our staff, use every enforcement power you need to move cases forward. Don't let a company push back on you if you have the science and the engineering complete and you know this is a, a product that needs to be recalled. So they know that leadership um, I also uh, is behind them in these recalls. We also have instituted, since I came to the commission, where once a week all five commissioners meet and we have Good weekly together. compliance briefings and then we have monthly compliance briefings. So we know the status of cases and can uh, give the staff our thoughts on how urgent we think these recalls are. Well, hopefully next time the press release doesn't take uh, six weeks. Uh, six hours should be enough. If not, you, your unilateral one. Uh, Mr. Walden, for questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, I, uh, Chairman, I, I thought I heard you say you have the authority at CSPE to unilaterally issue a press release. That is, if the uh, company does not cooperate. Okay, so and we have th and when we the have chairman's talking that. about six-week delay in getting a press release, was the company not cooperating in that process? The company was, at that point, um, they were cooperating once we told them we were going to do the recall. But when it said six weeks, it's not really, I mean, there Is were other things weeks? going on in that, that period and, of time. And what other things were going on? Okay, I can give you the recall notification process. Uh, I can go, I can talk to you. No, I mean, it's, it's a, First of all, you have to determine the scope of the product to be recalled. You have to request. And this is CSP CSPC has to do this, or the company? Uh, yes, the commission has to do this. Okay. You have to look. I mean, it's a two-page long or three-page long document of everything that has to occur right. before you can recall a case. Got it. And uh, you have to make sure the 800 number is right. um, and the website are operational. You have to test the uh, kit. The the company has to manufacture the kit. Um, they all, and, and these are required by your rules. These are required to have a successful recall, so that the in your rules, though, right? See, these are right. CSPC rules you're talking. about. I don't about. know that they're rules; they're just procedures. But but you control the procedures at CSPC. Uh, the S Consumer Product Safety Commission. Yes, we right. control it, but we also have to make sure the recall is gone, done appropriately. I fully, fully concur mm -hmm. with that. But I, I'm just trying to get at this issue of why it took six weeks to get a press release out. Well, this and was, was a, a staff C member's C notes. This was a staff member's notes, and I don't know if they. Um, so you don't think those are accurate? Maybe. No, I'm not saying that. Okay. Mr. Walden, I'm saying that 
it might have reflected that it was going on six weeks, but we do have to negotiate every word. They might go up to their supervisor or to the CEO, come back to us and said, we, we really dispute this death. So that was a good example, the death in the Durrell Asia case. The company did felt like that the um, that we should not mention the death. So when you get in whether or not you're going to mention a death, the lawyers on both sides have to get into it. You have to do an investigation. So it can take six weeks. If we want to say, no, we're going to list, say, four deaths, then you have to say in Storkcraft there were four deaths. You had to go back and make sure your facts were true on every death. You and do you think that's an unfair process? Do I think it's unfair? We have to make sure that it's correct. Right. I, I would concur. I think I mean, uh, what I would like to see on the front end is for us now that we're going forward and we have our safe, uh, our uh, team that's going to be working together, I, I th concur. hope we can shorten the part do you, do you uh, think the point that the, leading up to the recall. Do you think that the early warning system has been toothless? Do you, do you think that's worked? The early warning system was formed after the simplicity recall, and it puts together um, a team of people, lawyers, compliance officers right. to look at the data that is submitted it, to us. It, and it tries to get it, everybody in your agency, right, right to talk. But earlier on, you uh, mentioned, too, uh, you asked me if, um, or you asked one of the, um, the Riglianis, you asked them if they had a duty to report, and they did not. No, that was, that was the chairman. Right. That actually. And, um, and that is one of the issues. We do not get reports sometimes until years after an incident right. has occurred right. and, the, and the sample is gone. Um, so one of the issues that we were going to say in terms of improving the process, which would, re would take uh, probably statutory authority, is to require states to report uh, events to us. Okay. Uh, medical examiner's reports we purchase. Uh, we work with other right. um, we work voluntarily with hospitals. Uh, we have an, uh, the NICE system. We uh, have a number of ways. We go through um, press releases, but I mean, uh, tell, sure, uh, news, newspapers. Uh, newspapers. We do everything to find out about instances, but there's no duty to report from the from the state coroners or medical examiners. Thank you. I, that's helpful information to have as as we look at where we go forward. I, I haven't, I've just got 45 seconds left here, and we've got votes on. So let me ask you this: Is it is it the industry trade group? duty um, to come up with these new standards, or, or if there is a gap in safety, is it CSPC's duty to put in mandatory standards? You have that authority. Your predecessors have had that authority. You can step in and put a standard in that says we're not going to have drop side cribs or we're not going to have this type of manufacturing process, or, right? I think the ASTM should always have state-of-the-art, robust standards for all the products. I agree. But I also see when you see patterns of this kind right. of defect go on for years, then it's time for the CPSC, before it gets this late, to have a mandatory standard. And that is why when I came to the commission, uh, we started looking at the cribs. We, we changed it. the schedule so that this year we'll have the mandatory standard. We asked the ASTM. I called them personally, got them on the phone. You need to work with us right now to have the, t the most the best voluntary standard possible. They voluntarily said, yes, we'd love to work with you. They came and spent yesterday and the day before uh, and w and worked all day long. We have, um, and they've come to the agreement that we need to increase the wood um, uh, quality. Now it's a 50 pound standard. They agreed to an 86 pound standard. We need to uh, test the hardware, given the Canadian right. racking method. Right. I think, understand that's nine times, nine thousand times the hardware is put under stress to be test. They outlaw wooden screws, and they also, um, you know, talked about other uh, other issues that would make the voluntary Good. standard robust. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your work, and thanks for mm -hmm. your, your response Thank to our you. questions. Thanks, Ms. Walden. Ms. Shikowsky for uh, questions, please. So let me get it clear. We are going to have a mandatory um, standard for cribs that will prohibit drop side? Yes, ma'am, we will. And when will that be? It will be 2010. We hope by early summer to have the uh, NPR published in the Federal Register. We have to have 75 days of comment, and then we will have the standard by the end of the year. And We're also the... pushing the ASTM to go ahead and adopt voluntary standards uh, with this. And the good thing about having a mandatory standard, as you put in the CPSIA, is that it will be retroactive. 
It will cover cribs that are in public places like hotels and childcare facilities so that the drop side will be banned in the public places. But we still worry about cribs in homes that to continue to have the drop side. And in the meantime, how are we going to keep these cribs? Uh, are all of them with drop sides recalled? Well, we've recalled six million of them. And all these are voluntary recalls where we have repair kits. And we have to keep continuing to um, educate homeowner, uh, uh, people in the home who have cribs that there is a, a repair kit that they need to purchase. And so there, it still it will be in the home. And, and we st um, also want to reach out to the minority committees through the Neighborhood Safety uh, Network, the Minority Outreach Program. Also, we're looking at how we can communicate through every state's agency that licenses child care facilities so that we can send out emails to say, don't use this brand crib. Children have been injured or killed with these drop sides. So it's up to us to c continue with our public information campaign. But there still will be until, so after the 75-day comment period, when, when are we going to see a ban on drop-side cribs? Well, the prospectively, the ASTM has banned them. And I asked um, uh, the director of EHS, uh, well, I asked our person. Has banned the manufacturer. Right. But not all of them have been recalled. I don't think all, every crib has been recalled. Drop-side drop side, crib. But, um, it is banned prospectively. I will have to get back with you on that. I'm, I'm, I know that. But, but under under CPSC, the after the what, what does that take us to? There's a 75-day comment period. I would hope before. by December to have our mandatory rule done. Okay. And maybe I hope we could do it sooner. And the work that's been done the last two days by the ASTM should allow us to have uh, information. Plus, the agency put out an AMPR in 2008. So we are going to try as fast as possible to have this done. Okay. The, uh, I want to get the letters right. Um, the JP, what is it? The, what is it? JPMA. Voted against um, the, having a, a mandatory uh, standard or, or, or what, what was it? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to understand the relationship with the industry. And I, for a long time, I've been concerned about the issue, for example, of these um, press releases. And it, it, it's real. I understand, of course, getting the accuracy, but it doesn't take that long to figure out if someone has, if a child has died, or four children have died. And the fact that the industry doesn't want that in a press release, who cares? Why, why, why do we have to negotiate that? Why should it take so long? If this is a threat of life, do we have to do more? How, how does our, our, our new act, the Improvement Act, um, change the, the rule about these press releases? Well, I'll tell you, uh, give you an example. Just this week, we uh, recalled Darrell Asia, and the Today Show always is, uh, and other morning shows are very helpful to us, and they say we will announce this so that people can, can get the word on this. And we had had it that uh, in the press release that a child had died. Um, the um, people representing Darrell Asia were talking to Tom Castello up until right before he went on the air saying, do not mention that death. And so that is how we have to deal with this. And he mentioned it because we asked him to. Well, under the new act, what you said that there's been some improvements in that. What was improved? Well, the time that uh, on the, under 6B, it was just shortened the period of time. But still, the negotiations uh, about whether or not a death is, you know, the cause of the hardware or some um, fault of the uh, consumer, and that goes back and forth, and we have to be really hard about pushing forward that we're going to uh, list this death. I think we really have to do something about that, because don't you think that the impact of a statement where a death has occurred is much more powerful than... Yes. I mean, if parents know that a ch your child can tragically die by being entrapped, they will go in that room and look at that crib immediately, we hope. 
or even when a child is injured and we can, can show parents, this is not something that you can fix yourself. Please get the repair kit. And if the, and if it's the, uh, the uh, crib is in such bad shape, please do not use it. Well, as far okay, as I'm I've concerned, got to cut you off. Uh, oh, Mr. Burgess, we no, have two, minutes, two minutes left to vote. Thank sorry. you, though, for I, bringing I, this up. Mr. Burgess, questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here today. Uh, I hope we have, uh, I know we have a request into your office to have a meeting. I hope we're able to, uh, to have that soon. Um, Mr. Chairman, I will also say, having taken a trip out and, and seen the testing facility at the CPSC, I would encourage a, a field hearing at the testing facility sometime. I think it would be important for us to see how, how they do a good job with uh, really sometimes some pretty rudimentary tools. and. If we behave ourselves that day, they'll even let us test some of the toys if we promise not to break <laughs> them. Now, you said the, uh, I'm, I'm a little confused on the, now you've banned the manufacturer of drop side cribs, is that correct? ASTM has. ASTM has. And we will put that in our mandatory standard. Who needs to ban the import? Because a drop side crib could still be imported by a it's, retailer. It, well, what the ASTM is a voluntary standard, and they're saying in the standard, which they voted on in December of 2009, that it will no longer meet standards if it's drop side. But if, um, you know, we, we will have a rule this year, and um, and I want it, I don't want to whine, but I want to tell you that we did, we've had 48 federal register notices since the passage of the CPSCIA. There are so many rules under that we push forward that that's why that it takes a while to finish these rules. But uh, but anyway, you, I, I got but, you off your train of thought. I'm sorry. Well, what, some of the things we've been through before with the, the lead-up to the CPSIA was the problem that we have with stuff that's made overseas, read China, and then brought to this country that doesn't meet our standards. If we decided that it is the design of the drop side crib that is the problem, then it doesn't matter where it's made, in my opinion. If it's made overseas, then we should not allow its import. Now, what do That's we have to do with the World Trade Organization and all of our treaties and border stuff? What do we do to keep those cribs from coming in and being sold in retail outlets in this country? If we ban the drop side, we could stop it at the port. Have we banned it? We will in the, in the rule. We will uh, in the Which is going to happen? In 2010. We're going to finish that. It was originally scheduled to 2012, and we have expedited that to move it up to 2010. Yeah, the notes I have from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission Office of General Counsel uh, required actions pursuant to the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008, and this is dated September 2008, that we would do this by August of 2009. So I guess that slipped a little bit. I guess it did. We did um, the, the durable nursery equipment items. There were 12 of them, baby and baths and baby should, walkers. Shouldn't cribs have been up at the top of that list of 12? Crib, in my opinion, yes. That's why I've expedited it. So we, on this committee, can expect you to issue a mandatory ban on dropside cribs sometime in 2010? Yes, sir, and that will be retroactively applied for cribs in... Uh, public places such as day child care facilities and hotel rooms, but it won't apply to bans in homes. So the consumer would still have it under section of 104. Well, if they had existing ones, but will they still be able to go to a retail outlet and purchase one? No. Would a retailer be able to import one for sale? No, not after we um, say that they don't meet the standard. So we'll be able to stop those at the border? Yes, sir. Okay. What, um, let me just ask you, we, one of the things we, we struggled with during the, uh, the run-up to the bill in 2008 was the, the funding and, and personnel levels at the CPSC. Mm -hmm. Where are we with that now? Um, well, we're at the level of having 530 FTEs, full-time equivalents, and we now employ, as of today, 479. So uh, we are, but we have 45 recruitments in the process of being hired. And it's our goal to be at the top of the 530 uh, this year. Now, we were given, uh, both Nancy Nord and, and Mr. Moore uh, felt that the funding levels we were providing CPSC in past years were not satisfactory, those were increased. What actions are you taking now? We're going to be in a tough budget 
year, guess what? It's, it's going to be real tough. And yet, this is one of the more important functions, and and uh, but still very low on the totem pole of things that get funded. So, what actions are you taking now to ensure that your funding does not does not slip? Well, when we um, I go and meet personally with OMB, and I go myself to talk to them how important it is to be able to uh, implement the CPSIA and other statutes. I ask them to hold our agency harmless. And so we, I've said, you know, $10 million to the CPSC is a tremendous amount. $10 million to a mega agency would not have the same effect. And we, we keep um, uh, demonstrating to them how we're using it. Also, with Booz Allen Hamilton, which is the company that's going to be doing a management, operational, and strategic plan for us, they will be looking at what what uh, additional resources we need or how we use existing resources to accomplish our goal, which is keeping consumers safe. Well, I would just say, don't forget, you have friends on this committee. If thank the uh, if the appropriators aren't treating you squarely, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know we've got to and go thank vote. Thank you, Mr. No, Burgess. Thank you. That concludes all of our questioning. First, I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Waxman, and the attachment from the uh, Consumers Union be made part of record, Mr. Waxman's opening statement. And that concludes all questioning. I want to thank our witnesses for coming today and for their testimony. The Rules Committee provide that members have days to 10 days to submit additional questions for the record. I know there are questions as to manufacturers have a duty to report deaths and injuries uh, and are after you do a recall. We've seen them going to the stores. There's no notification. So I'm, there's going to be other questions. We'll mm -hmm. follow up probably with you, uh, Madam uh, Chairperson. Thank you. So I ask unanimous consent that the contents of our document be, binder be entered in the record, provided that the committee staff may redact any concerns about privacy, business proprietary, or other law enforcement sensitive issue. Without objection, documents will be entered in the record. That concludes our hearing. This meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you all for being here. Thank, Thank you. you.